Okay, I think uh, we should start this uh, afternoon session. Um, so it is a pleasure for me to announce the first speaker of this afternoon, which is Joan Gauntlet from Imperial College. And Joan will talk about brains wrapped on spindles. I would say, Joan, the floor is yours. Thanks, Eric. Um, so thanks for the invitation to this meeting. And thanks to the organizers, Nicholas and Joao and Suzanne and Julian. It would have been nice to have been there, but my um, teaching schedule kept me away. But as you can see, it's very sunny here in London as well. Um, I want to talk about some uh, work that I've done uh, in these four papers, mostly, well, uniformly with Dario Martelli and James Sparks, uh, and also uh, with his stu their students, uh, Pietro Ferreira and Juan Pipina, and then another paper briefly with uh, Davide Cassani. So um, let me just begin by reminding you of some uh, old uh, uh, ideas or a paradigm which has dominated a lot of work generalizing the original uh, ADS-CFT correspondence in a supersymmetric context. Um, let's just recall first the basic examples where we have the near horizon limit of D3 brains giving rise to ADS-5 cross S5 or five brains and M2 brains giving rise to these other ADS cross sphere solutions. In each case, the world volume of the brain is just um, Minkowski space of the appropriate dimension. So Melda Sina and Nunes in uh, 2000 asked the, the question, what um, uh, is a, how, can, can we generalize this to take the world volume of the brains to be some lower dimension Minkowski space with some compact internal space? So two questions. Um, immediately arise. One is, can you preserve supersymmetry? We would like to do that for various reasons, not least stability. Um, and secondly, if you do this, and then you look at uh, length scales much larger than the compact cycle, does it flow to a CFT? And if it does, can we, can we uh, find a gravity solution that describes what that is? Um, so the supersymmetry question, it is has been solved or was solved going back to original ideas of Witten in, back in 1988. And the idea there is um, you, if you have, if you start with the a field theory and then you couple it, you, you put it on the, uh, on the, this world, on this, um, this manifold with this compact space, but then you compact, you couple it to background R symmetry currents. So the killing spinner equation um, for the field theory on this background will schematically look some, something like this. Here's the usual spin connection acting on spinners. And then the spinner, if it's carrying um, some R symmetry, is also acted on by some R symmetry gauge fields. And the idea of Witten's was that you simply, uh, in the simplest case, locally cancel out omega or some part of the spin connection with some part of the R symmetry connection, such that this equation just becomes constant spinners on the manifold. And this um, topological twist, Witten's original idea was in a, in a quite a different context, uh, has a very natural geometric point of view in the context of brains, in that if you take a special holonomy manifold, which preserves supersymmetry, then there's a preferred class of cycles called calibrated cycles, where if you wrap a brain on a calibrated cycle, you preserve supersymmetry. And you can show that the structure of the normal bundle to these calibrated cycles is such that supersymmetry is realized precisely on the brain by, by this mechanism. So uh, the original examples that Meldestine and Nunes put forward over 20 years ago um, include a number of examples. Let me just illustrate uh, with five brains, and in particular five brains wrapping um, two cycles inside a clabby, clabby R manifolds, and to be calibrated, they should be holomorphic two cycles. So you can do this in two different ways. Um, if you take a two cycle inside a Calabi R two fold, then um, that preserves uh, n equals two supersymmetry on the four non-compact dimensions of the fibrin. And in this case, you can find solutions that look like ADS seven cross S four in the UV, and then flow to ADS five cross sigma two cross S four in the IR. So this is the IR, uh, this ADS five solution is, is dual to the conformal field theory of the wrap brains. And I've just put this in inverted commas because 
the, uh, the S4 is non-trivially fibered over the sigma two. Um, and you can also do it in a second way where you take the, the, re, the um, two cycle to be inside Calabi R3. And uh, the only difference at least at the level of what I'm describing here is that there's half as much supersymmetry preserved. And in both cases, these basic solutions, uh, first found by Molasin and Nunes and, and then generalized a, a little bit later, this sigma two uh, is a Riemann surface of genus G. And in the simplest cases, it has a constant, um, a constant curvature metric. Um, good. So there's been many, many generalizations of this idea, and I don't want to review all of it, but let me just very briefly remind you that you can generalize this to wrapping D3 brains and M brains on Riemann surfaces. For five brains and D3 brains, you have extra spatial directions which you can wrap brains, uh, you could wrap on, and you can wrap on higher dimensional cycles. So that's another development. One that will be more important for this talk is the following. An another way of generating conformal field theories in ADS CFT is to take um, uh, membranes or D3 brains at the apex of Calabi R cones. And by definition, and it, the, the cross section of a Calabi R cone is a Sasaki Einstein manifold. So you, you consider brains in this setup, you get a field theory, a supersymmetric conformal field theory living on the membranes or the D3 brains with non, non wrap directions. But then you can ask the question let me take those conformal field theories or these brains in this geometric point of view and then wrap on a world volume with a topological twist and play the same game again. And I'll come back to this in a little bit more detail later. What I want to tell you about today is uh, something uh, which has two new, well, a few new features. So I want to describe D3 brains and to, to a lesser extent membr membranes and five brains that are wrapped on a spindle. And I'll tell you exactly what a spindle is in a moment. But here, the new feature, as from what I, in regard to what I've just been saying, is that the spindle has orbifold singularities. So we're wrapping on a, on a, on a space that has orbifold singularities. And secondly, and more significantly perhaps, is that supersymmetry is not being realized by the usual topological twist. So it's a new way of realizing supersymmetry by wrapping these brains and correspondingly the ADS solutions that will, of which I'll show you, uh, a, a new uh, way of realizing or generalizing ADS CFT outside of this usual wrap brain by the usual topological twist scenario. So what's a spindle? Um, a spindle, well, for, in, in terms of pictures, here's one. Um, so it's topologically a two sphere but it has conical defects at the, at, at the poles. And the, co the conical defects at the poles are specified by two integers, which are called n plus and minus. And we take that n plus and minus to be positive integers with no um, common factor. You can also think of this uh, as a weighted projective space. So uh, you take um, C2 and then you quotient out by a C star action with weights N minus and N plus, and that will give you exactly the same topologies I've just, been, I've just described. So this is an orbifold, and an orbifold, um, let me remind you, is a generalization of a manifold where, wherein a manifold is locally modeled by little patches of Rn. An orbifold, by definition, is locally modified it is locally modeled by little patches of Rn mod gamma, where gamma is some discrete group acting on Rn. So here is obviously a little bit of R2, but we've taken out a conical deficit angle. Here's another bit of R2 with a different conical de deficit, and we patch those together suitably with, with patching functions, smooth patching functions, taking into account that they, um, we have to patch with these different defects. So the spindles is the simplest version of a, of a two-dimensional orbifold. And a couple of facts in contrast to what I was just saying is that constant curvature metrics, unlike a Riemann surface, don't exist on a, on a spindle. That's a, a, that's a mathematical fact, which you can, you can prove. Um, and the Euler character is given by one on N minus plus one on N plus. And if you think of N plus minus being one, there's no deficit angle. So formally, 
and I, I won't, this won't be included as a special case, but at least formally, the Euler character then would be two. So you can sort of see that this is a reasonable definition or a reasonable fact about spindles. Good, so that's a spindle. So we wanna wrap brains on spindles. So let me tell you what the plan then of the rest of the talk is. Um, we wanna wrap D3 brains on spindles, membranes on spindles and five brains. Because of time, are we mostly talking about the first one? And if we wrap on a spindle, we'll, we'll be led to a two-dimensional conformal field theory on the non-compact directions that has 0, 0,2 supersymmetry. And we'll, I'll describe new ADS3 solutions, which are dual to these. Um, and in fact, these solutions actually were found back in 2006 um, and, and have been completely obscure as what the dual field theory is. But, but now we have a precise conjecture and we'll be able to do a precise field theory conjecture to test that. For the membranes, there's some similar story. Um, in addition to finding new ADS2 solutions associated with the membrane wrapping on the spindle, there also is a nice UV description where you start with ADS4 in the, in the UV and then flow to ADS2 across the spindle in the IR. And they are, turn out to be a, um, a kind of accelerating four-dimensional black hole. So it's a new interpretation or a new way of viewing four-dimensional accelerating black holes. So let's see how far we get on this plan. So to begin with, as I said, these Sasaki Einstein manifolds are going to play some little background role. So I should tell you or remind you a little bit about them. So the D3 brains at the apex of the Calabi Alf cone like this. And by cone, I just mean the metric is of this form here, where the cross section is Sasaki Einstein 5. The type 2b solution, if you zoom in on the D3 brains, is just ADS5 cross Sasaki Einstein 5. And there's just five bond flux excited. And now dual to n equals one conformal field theories in four dimensions. And there's a similar story for you take M2 brains at the apex of Calabi R4 cones, Calabi R4 fold cones, and you get ADS4 across the Saki Einstein 7. And now there's purely electrically charged four form flux. And the dual conformal field theories, which I've indicated with the amount of supersymmetry here, um, have been very well studied. And this is a, a very long story. We won't need to know any of the details about that, but I do want to emphasize a lot's known about these. For example, these are very well-known quiver gauge theories, as, as are these with John Simon's couplings and so on. Geometrically, I'll have to remind you something else about Sasaki and same manifolds. The manifolds always have a killing vector, a canonical killing vector, and that makes sense because the field theories are due to dual to have an R symmetry. So geometrically, they have to have a canonical killing vector. We call it psi. It doesn't vanish anywhere. And you can construct a one form that's dual to that killing vector. And you can always therefore write the metric in this form here. And the trans, so the tangent space splits into this direction along the killing vector, and then a transverse Kähler Einstein. Um, so on this transverse space is a Kähler Einstein metric. And the this so this, this five, if you think of this as a vibration, eta is fibered over the Kähler Einstein via this geometric condition. So the D of this one form is rho, which is the Ricci form of this Kähler Einstein. The thing I want to remind you about here is this vibration. You can think of this as a vibration uh, in, in two K, K, depending on whether the orbits of, of this killing vector close or not you'll get a vibration over a Kähler-Einstein manifold or a Kähler-Einstein orbifold. If the orbits don't close, you're in so-called the irregular class and there's no vibration. If you're in the quasi-regular case, you have a U1 vibration over a Kähler-Einstein orbifold, an orbifold of much the same kind I was describing before. Um, but the one that's gonna be most interesting here, which is the simplest thing to understand, is the regular class when you really have a bona fide Kähler-Einstein manifold, and then you take a U1 vibration over that. And you'll see why this class is important in what I say. For five dimensions, I can tell you what the full complete list of regular Sasaki Einstein manifolds is. And if the Kähler Einstein is CP2, CP1 cross CP1, or del Pezzo, the U1 vibration leads to either S5, T11, or spaces which don't have a name, or a slight subtlety is 
um, S5 mod Z3 or 2 on 1 mod Z2. So this is the canonical Sasaki Einstein, and, it, and then you can take a cube root of the corresponding bundle that, that exists there. That's a small subtlety, but it will play an important role in a minute. And for D equals seven, well, this, this is not a complete list, but just to give you a flavor, if you take CP3, you'll get S7. And again, there's two subcases you can also can consider. You can take product of three two spheres, and you get a manifold called Q triple one, or a discrete quotient of it. And another well-known one is M32, which is the U1 vibration of a CP2 cross CP1. So the point here is, <clears throat> here is a subset of, in this case, and a complete set of Sasaki Einstein manifolds. And we know lots about their dual field theories. For example, this is just N equals four Young Mills theory, and this will be dual to the klebanov witten theory. Okay, so we wanna construct supergravity solutions that describe these four and three dimensional field theories dual to these spaces after you wrap them on a spindle. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we use, uh, it's not the method we originally did to find these solutions, but let me tell you a posteriori how, how you can think about them. You can use consistent KK truncations. So start with type 2B supergravity, reduce on a Sasaki Einstein 5 to five dimensional minimal gauge supergravity. And you can do that consistently, which means that any local solution of this minimal gauge supergravity can be uplifted on a Sasaki Einstein 5 to give you an exact solution of type 2b. For example, the vacuum uplifts to the vacuum solution ADS5 cross Sasaki Einstein 5. And you can do the same in 11 dimensions by uplifting on uh, solutions of minimal gauge supergravity on a Sasaki Einstein 7. Okay, so that's the key tool. And now the solution is simple enough. I'm just going to sort of flash it up to you. Um, so this is five dimensional gauge supergravity, Einstein Maxwell, kinetic term for the Maxwell field. Um, the five dimensional metric is a warped product of ADS3 and spindle. The metric on the spindle is given here. DY is a coordinate Y and Z. And you'll see there's a function Q here, which is a cubic. And the cubic function depends on one free constant A. And the gauge field, also just depends on that one free constant. So to build the spindle solution, we have the ADS3 is manifest, we take Y to lie between root two roots of the cubic. So when we get to Y is one root of the cubic, the size of this Z direction shrinks at these two points. So you can think of it as a line interval with a circle that's shrinking at each end. Now what you can't do is make sure it, smooth, it smoothly shrinks at either end but you can make it such that at each end, there's a conical deficit that moreover is quantized. And this is achieved by choosing A, the free constant A to be a function of N plus or minus and the period of Z to be corresponding a function of N plus or minus as given. So the point I wanna emphasize here, it's a completely concrete solution. It's very simple and just uses a simple um, feature of restricting Y to lie between two roots of this cubic function. You can calculate the R symmetry flux through the spindle and you, it's a little calculation and you get this answer. And that's not, maybe not an immediately significant, but it is significant because this is not equal to the Euler character. So immediately we see that this is not, is we have, we have a solution where we're not realizing supersymmetry by a topological twist, which would necessarily have the R symmetry flux equaling the Euler character of the space you're, the two space you're wrapping on. Furthermore, the killing spinners are not constant on the spindle, which is an, an associated fact. So that's the first point. It's not the topological twist. The second point is, as I said, we can uplift, uplift on the Sasaki Einstein five space, and we'll do that in the regular class that I was emphasizing before. And even though we have conical singularities downstairs, when we uplift to type 2b upstairs, we find that um, the solution is completely smooth. And you have to do this carefully. So for example, if m plus is two, these are the spindle deficit angles and m minus is three, seven, nine, and so on, then you can uplift on S5 mod Z3 and it's completely regular. If n minus is five, nine, and so on, 
you can uplift on S5. So this is the one that's associated with N equals four Yang Mills theory. Now that might sound mysterious. How could something with conical singularities downstairs uplift to something upstairs that's, that's smooth? In fact, um, that's very simple to explain. So rather than explain how this works, which is considerably more complicated, let me give you a, a much simpler example that will convince you that's at least plausible. So let's take a three sphere and just write it in coordinates theta phi one and phi two, where phi one and phi two have period two pi, and the theta right ranges between zero and pi on two. So one sh circle shrinks at zero and the other circle shrinks at pi on two. If you take the three sphere and you reduce on this killing vector, n plus d by d phi one plus n minus d by d phi two, the first point is if n plus and n minus is one, this is just a hop vibration and it's a hop vibration over a two sphere, which you may be familiar with. If n plus and n minus are not equal to one, you get a, a vibration over a spindle. And to see that, let's just introduce new coordinates, phi one is n plus times nu, phi two is n minus nu plus one and n plus times mu. And with a bit of thought, delta mu and delta nu have period two pi. And the significance of these coordinates is that this, this killing vector is now just d by d nu. So to do the KK reduction, we, we just do it, do it trivially in these new coordinates. And we have a vibration over a two dimensional base space. And the key point is this base space sort of looks like a two sphere apart from this lambda. And lambda is this function down here. Oops. Um, uh, lambda is this function down here at the bottom. And you see that it has conical singularities at two poles specified by n plus and n minus. So that's, that's a three sphere story where a U1 vibration over, you have, you have a spindle, you uplift on a circle and you get a smooth round three sphere. For these cases, where you take these more complicated solutions, supplement it with the Sasaki Einstein, as long as you do this correlated uplift, which I was describing here, which is not obvious, but it's, it comes out of the analysis, then the upstairs solution is completely smooth. <clears throat> okay, so that's, that's the construction. Um, in fact, historically, the upstairs solutions, type 2B solutions, we actually constructed them back in 2006. And I don't want to explain where that came from. You can ask me in the questions afterwards. Um, but we constructed these ADS3 cross spindle cross the Saki Einstein 5 solutions, but we didn't think of them in that term at all. We just had a construction of a, a regular seven dimensional manifold. Um, and it was completely mysterious what the dual field theory was. But rethinking in terms of this vibration over a spindle, it gives us a very precise conjecture. You, the dual field theory to these solutions is take the four dimensional conformal field theory dual to ADS5 cross the psyche Einstein 5, could be N equals four Yang Mills theory for the five sphere case. You wrap it on a spindle and then flow to the infrared. That's the conjecture. On the gravity side, in this old paper, we actually worked out the central charge, but I'll rewrite it in a way which is more suitable for this conjecture. Um, which is, a, it, which is a this form. So it depends on the spindle data and the acentral charge of the four dimensional field theory. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But there's a question from Alex, I think. Yeah, hi, Jerome. Hi. Uh, quick question. What else do you know about the 2D CFT other than the central charge? Do you know like the spectrum of BPS operators or? We know um, it, it, at the moment, we don't know too much, but you could, there, there's, you could probably calculate uh, the conformal dimensions of some baryonic operators of wrapping D5 brains around various cycles on the internal manifold. So not in this specific context, but in related contexts, you can do that. And I think you, that could be done here. I see, thanks. Okay, so from the gravity side, we have this central charge written in this suggestive way. We have a conjecture for what the field theory is just from the geometrical construction. Do they agree? Well. We can do a field theory calculation now, and we can use field theory C extremization of Benini and Bob. One more question. Could we just get the question? Uh, there's a question. Oh, okay, sure. Can you hear me, Jerome? Uh, yes. I can't see who it is, though. Okay, Jerome. 
I, I wanted to, to ask, what does it mean to put any of four on a spindle? Because, I mean, it's, there's this singular point. So how do you actually define uh, the, I don't know, the path integral there in terms of... Uh, yeah, great question. <laughs> we'll come back to that question at the end of the talk. I don't have an answer, but it's a very good question. But gravity is telling you everything, well, I haven't given you the next punchline, but gravity is saying, yes, you can do that, no problem. But let's see from the field theory how that works. So we will take the field theory and we would, Vinny um, Bobev says, the central charge can be, uh, is the one that extremizes a trial central charge over the space of R symmetries. Oops, Alex, another question. Yeah, sorry, can I just ask a follow-up question to that? Um, since this is kind of like an orbifold singularity, can we think that it's similar in spirit to what we do when we do the replica trick in CFTs, say to compute entanglement, where we do put the CFT on a space with a conical, in that case, excess? Uh, it, it, is it similar in flavor? And there, we don't think it's a problem, and we think you can define these things. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure the answer to that. I mean, one thing is you can't go which is what you can't do there either. But you, well, maybe you can in some cases, but uh, here you can't go to a covering space. So these are called bad orbifold singularities in the sense that you can't go to a covering space to get rid of them. If the, the deficit angles were not, with, if the integers m plus and m minus had common factors, so two and two, you yeah. could just go to a covering space and it would just be s2 mod, mod z2. Uh, so you can't do that. But maybe something along the lines of, of that technology can be done here, but I'm, I'm not sure how, how. I see. Thanks. Yeah, good question. A point on this also is that if you can think of these as like in, in insertions of some defect operator, that Alex was uh, suggesting. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, good. another good point. Okay, so the field theory calculation is. Um, start with the field theory trial R charge, sorry, central charge as a function of trial R symmetry. But a, a new feature here for people, perhaps experts who wrap brains on cycles, is that here we have to allow for a mixing with the internal symmetry direction of the spindle. So the spindle has a U1 direction, and we have to allow for a mixing there. And the way you do this is you formally take the six form polynomial of the four dimensional conformal field theory um, and, and compactify it on the spindle directions. So there's a little procedure you have to do here, but it's basically saying you've got the four dimensional anomaly polynomial, sorry, the anomaly polynomial of the four dimensional field theory, and you want to just reduce that on, on the, in this case, a spindle, but allowing for the fact that there's flux through the spindle and allowing for the possibility that you can have this mixing. So this is a bit of a procedure, but you can do that. And for example, the R, tri the R trial charge must be a combination of the R symmetry of the four dimensional symmetry, plus a, um, a, a linear combination of the, of the direction which generates the isometries of the spindle. So you do this procedure and this is some work, but you do it and you find that there is, yes, there is non-trivial mixing, which you can match this number to the gravity side. I didn't say that before, but you can. But more immediately is you find that this field theory central charge exactly gives you the supergravity central charge. So while some questions remain, this is strong evidence that these, um, uh, that we have identified the correct quantum field theory interpretation of these ADS3 solutions that were originally found back in 2006. <coughs> So there's many open questions and some have been mentioned. Um, another one for, uh, that's immediate is everything I said so far was just highlighting the infrared of the solution. So I was talking about four dimensional field theories that you're wrapping on a spindle and then you're, the language I'm using is then flowing to a two dimensional field theory with this spindle internal space in the gravity dual. Um, so if it's gonna hold together, one would expect that there are supergravity solutions of this form, supplemented with the Sasaki Einstein 5, which would come along for the ride if you could construct these solutions engage supergravity, 
which is not guaranteed. You may have to do a direct two beat construction. So that's an outstanding question to give us more confidence about this picture. Let me, let me now move to another example. So that was D3 brains wrapping a spindle. Let me uh, talk about membranes wrapping a spindle. And the story has several similar features. Um, we now start with four dimensional minimal gauge supergravity, and we're gonna uplift on a Sasaki-Einstein seven. So we're thinking about the quiver gauge series, dual to Sasaki-Einstein seven and wrapping them on a spindle. And there's very similar radius two cross spindle solutions. And in terms of, uh, just to give you a flavor, if I, if I wrote it up, which I'm not going to write it up, it would look exactly like this. There would be an ADS2 there. You would see some slightly different numbers here and there. The most significant thing is this cubic becomes a quartic. But this idea of putting Y between two roots of the cubic, now putting them between two roots of a quartic allows everything to go through. So there's a lot of work to do, but conceptually it's the same. Once again, there's no topological twist because the asymmetry flux through the spindle is not the Euler character. Once again, you can uplift in the Sasaki Ion 7 in the regular class and you get completely regular solutions in D equals 11. And once again, these solutions actually were known in the 11 dimensional ones in 2006, but we didn't have any idea of what their interpretation was. So all of that's analogous to what I've just been saying about the D3 brains, but there's some interestingly some new features. So let me emphasize the new features. The first one is with ADS2 solutions in ADS-CFT, you have the freedom of having rotation. So here I've written down a metric um, for ADS2 um, with an, um, an extra uh, direction, which has this twisting um, by a piece which is, so rho and tau parameterize the ADS2, and this twisting of the circle direction is consistent with the isometries of ADS2, and you can sort of see that because the exterior derivative of this one form is d rho d tau, and d rho d tau is the volume form of ADS2. So the point is that you can, we're doing ADS-CFT ADS -CFT with ADS-2, which has its own unique flavors. One of them is that you can add rotation. And so we could generalize the solutions with spindles with this rotation. So that was one new point. The second new point is for these ones, we could find a UV completion. So the solutions that look like ADS-4 with spindle cross sections in the UV, and they flow to ADS2 cross spindle in the IR. And what is this family of solutions? Well, it's in fact some solutions that were written down in 1976 locally. It's a two parameter family of supersymmetric, dionically charged, carrying both electric and magnetically charged, and rotating, and crucially accelerating. So the rotating is, is kind of to do with what I was just saying. We knew that they would be magnetically charged. You also need electrically charged. The acceleration is precisely the fact or corresponding to the fact that there's conical defects on the spindle. So people who know about this subject know that accelerating black holes have these, uh, these defects and physically you can think of them as pulling and literally accelerating a black hole solution. And here we're interpreting the acceleration or these conical defects as being defects on a spindle. Now, there's a long history of dealing with those conical singularities and how to think about them, replacing those cosmic strings and so on. Here, by uplifting on the, a regular Sasaki-Einstein 7, you can completely get rid of them. So they're just a mirage. Downstairs they exist, but upstairs they disappear. So that's an interesting feature. One more subtle feature is the following. You might think that the non-rotating case is the simplest version of this story, but the conformal boundary here in the ADS4, um, in the case when the rotation is non-zero, the boundary is exactly what you'd expect it to be. It's a line, time, the time direction across the spindle. When the rotation equals zero, 
the conformal boundary de degenerates and it degenerates in a funny way. The spindle on the boundary, as you reduce the angular momentum, turns into two separated pieces with an acceleration horizon going out to the conformal boundary. And there's a topological twist on each of the two halves, but with a different topological twist on each half. So the conformal boundary in this sort of nose, when it's not rotating, it should somehow be two types of different topological twists. I, we don't understand why that is, but I just wanted to highlight that, that feature. So the rotating case, which you might think is a more complicated one, in a certain sense, is the most simple one here. Okay, so that's pretty much what I wanted to tell you. So I'll, I'll, I've got three more slides, which I'll sort of summarize and highlight some open questions. <clears throat> so we've wrapped uh, D3 brains and M2 brains on spindles. And one of the main take-home take messages is that supersymmetry is being realized without the usual topological twist. And there's already been a number of generalizations uh, in various directions um, by these authors. If you uplift the solutions carefully on a regular Sasaki-Einstein manifold, then the upstairs metric is regular. And so that just sort of prompts a more general question. I mean, if we're doing ADS-CFT with orbifold singularities, are there any general messages? I mean, th these examples work, but what, what are the rules? Is it just case by case? If you've got orbifold singularity, try your luck at uplifting and seeing what happens, or is there some uh, more deeper guiding principle? Another thing which I don't want to talk about at all, except to highlight it, is in the last couple of years, again with Martelli and Sparks in particular, we've been uh, pursuing a program of understanding the most general class of ADS3 cross GK7 solutions and ADS2 cross GK9 solutions, where they preserve 0, 0,2 supersymmetry and equals 2 supersymmetry uh, with the same flux that I've been talking about for these spindles. So the spindle solutions are very special examples of this more general family. So, in fact, that's exactly the way in which we, we, we stumbled across this spindle story. So they're a special class of a much bigger geometric story, and that's a program that we're pursuing. So I just want to advertise this bigger picture where these solutions fit into. Um, from the field theory side, well, this question's already been asked, so I won't say much more about it. What are the rules in the field theory? If we put, if we say, for example, think about N equals four Young Mills theory, um, what, what are what what rules should be being placed at the orbifold points? And some some of some cases are obstructed. Remember, for the five sphere, I could combine it. I could I could do it on a certain spindle, but not other spindles. So where is that obstruction coming from? Um, very briefly, we can wrap five brains on spindles. Um, so there's no analog of the Sasaki Einstein story here. Um, let me just mention that uh, one surprise is that it's not supersymmetry isn't being realized by the usual topological twist with constant spinners, but now you find that the magnetic charge is equal to the Euler character. So it depends a little bit what you mean by topological twist here, but the way supersymmetry is realized when you wrap a fiber in a spindle is, well, a topologically a topological twist or a topological twist, but without constant spinners. So that's another interesting twist on the story. Um, for the five brains, you can do again, do a field theory calculation, much what I was describing for the D3 brains, and you find an exact agreement between the field theory um, A maximization calculation and the A central charge, which you cal cal uh, calculate from the gravity side. The 11 dimensional solutions when you uplift the five brains on the four sphere have orbifold singularities. So what are the rules? Should we allow orbifold singularities in ADS-CFT upstairs or should we be restricting to smooth ones? It seems to be working. What's the rules? And then finally, just quickly, uh, I've also touched on UV completions. For the M2 accelerating black holes, for the M2 case, the accelerating black holes provide um, a nice interpretation of a UV completion of M2 brains wrapping uh, these spindles. This connection with uh, entropy recovering using complex saddle points, I won't say anything more about this. I already mentioned that um, 
open questions, we have these accelerating M2 brain cases. There should be analogs to D3 brains and M5 brains. Everything I've been saying is wrapping brains on two-dimensional orbifolds, the spindles, but what about three-dimensional ones, four-dimensional ones? And there's many, many possibilities. Is, is there just a huge set of new examples? Overall, my feeling is um, there's a big new landscape to explore, and hopefully that'll be uncovered in the, in the coming, uh, well, coming months and years. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you, Jerome, for this uh, very nice presentation. We have five minutes for questions. Uh, I see that uh, Julian has a question. Hi, Jerome. Thanks for a very clear talk. So I was just I was just want to speculate. I mean, it's, it smells a little bit like these things have to do with non-equilibrium steady states, because it's so that also would be in line with your accelerating black holes. It's sort of like um, non-equilibrium solutions, but they have the Euclidean. You know they have Euclidean solutions, but they're not uh, regular. So you, you sort of have defects, let's say, that want to introduce locally two different unroot temperatures, and then you can't quite reconcile it without having singularities. Yeah, sort of. Except that all of that's sort of in the internal space. So you, you take your brain, you wrap them on those with those. Let's see, use the language of defects, but then you flow in the non-compact part of the, the wrapped brains, the D three brains, or the membranes, or five brains. And that, that space just realizes the field theory. So all of that, yeah, all, all of that data is getting sort of washed out in the RG flow and just being encoded in whatever this lower dimensional, completely bona fide um, conformal field theory is. And it's completely bona fide because the upstairs solution as a 2B or D of 11 solution is completely regular. Now, in fact, in 2006, if I'd given you this solution um, and ever given this talk, there would be no indication that there's any anything pathological going on, or well, not pathological, any anything with orbifolds. It would have just been a purely regular solution upstairs, and one would have tried to think hard about what the field theory was and then not make progress. Can so you, there may be some formal correlations, but I think I think the physics is probably a bit different. But the black holes, how does it work? So you had this one example where you say it's accelerating black holes. Yeah, exactly. So it's a, but up, if I gave you the eleven-dimensional solution, the eleven, all those, all those all conical singularities disappear. But it doesn't mean that they're meaningless. I mean, no, no, no. It doesn't mean that they're meaningless. So as if for the rotating case, the conformal boundary, the conformal boundary, you you do see the conical defects there. So may, may, maybe that's maybe in that context. But it's that's again. There's time. And then there's a compact two-dimensional space which has the orbital singularities on them, but it's it, it's it's zero temperature because it's supersymmetric. Oh, that's a, that's another point I should say. Thanks. Maybe that's the key point. We have time for a very short question. Is there any question here? And if if oh, there's a, a short one. Oh, was the one in the chat? No, it was. Raise his hands. Hi, Jerome. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the talk. I had a very, very brief, kind of almost technical question. You've spoken about how you've got these twists which aren't twists because the R symmetry uh, charge doesn't match the Euler character. Mm. Um, any kind of formula for the difference of these two quantities, maybe in terms of the, the conformal killing spinners or some, some integral thereof? Or, or do you? Um... Uh, not that I, no, I think, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm not, I'm not sure if I can see a connection. I mean, it, you calculate with, with the solution, you just calculate the, um, the flux and it, well, did I, how much did I write it down? Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, you calculate that number in the solution and that, that's the other character and they're not equal. Um, could it be something else? Uh, yeah, I suppose the question is, could this have been some other number? And that's an interesting question. But I don't know the answer to that. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think uh, we should stop now. Let's thank Jerome once more for this nice seminar. Thanks.